first of all, congratulations on your cost to win last night. We last spoke a couple of years ago on the eve of your book win for the first of your Cromwell books, Wolf Hall. I presume at that point you had no idea at all of the way in which this was all going to play out. When I won the first book, uh, I felt a, a sense of sober, righteous triumph. When I won the second book, uh, I was completely astonished. And part of me always will be, I think. And then when it came to the Costa last night, well, I had to say to myself, it doesn't seem likely, but if you can win a second booker, then anything is possible. You said in your acceptance speech last night, I'm not sorry, and I wanted to ask you about that. Do you feel as if on any level you ought to be sorry? Well, I feel there has been an undercurrent to the coverage, which is why doesn't this little woman go home and give everyone else a chance? But of course, there isn't a quota system for winning book prizes, as far as I'm aware. It's my moment now, but it will be somebody else's moment soon enough. And my success isn't actually taking away from anyone else's. It's good for books in general, it's good for readers and for reading and for publishing when a book hits the spot with the general public as well as with the critics. Yes, yeah, so before Wolf Hall you were a critically acclaimed author, your reviews were always excellently reviewed in all the broadsheets, but you, your sales at that point were unspectacular. What does it mean to you emotionally and practically to suddenly find yourself in the bestseller bracket? I had almost thought that will never happen. And in a way it's my fault because I keep changing what I do. I couldn't build up a regular readership because no one knew what the next book would be. And I was in the habit of saying to my publishers, I will deliver X, and then delivering Y, which would be completely different. I feel that with this project, I've come to the strongest part of my writing life, the most significant part of it. I think, if it's not too romantic, that this trilogy is what I was meant to write. It's what I've been in training for. It's in terms of measuring my achievement not by sales, but by the progress I think I've made in my craft. The sales are a lovely bonus, but in a way they happen to the author, the professional person, the writer in the side is quite different and has a different set of priorities. You said these were the books that you were meant to write. At what point did you understand that? Was it when you first set pen to paper and started to describe Thomas Cromwell? Or is it a knowledge that you acquired as you went along? While I was doing the initial research, I had all sorts of qualms and doubts. And I think I suppose part of it was, can I sell Cromwell to the public? He's not on the face of it an attractive character. And then also with historical fiction, you're always saying to yourself, OK, I've assembled all this material, but what is the book going to sound like? And what happened was when I wrote the first half page, I had a tremendous sense of right, this is it. It was as if something just clicked. And so many decisions about what the book would be like were taken in the very first paragraph. Obviously, I'd been moving subconsciously towards those decisions, but I didn't know that I'd taken them until the words appeared on the screen in front of me. One of the things that's so remarkable about the book is the voice, the voice of Thomas Cromwell, his internal voice, which is what we, the readers, are hearing as, as we're going through the story. And I wondered where you thought that voice came from. The way it's done is by thinking yourself inside the, the, the universe of your characters, their world picture, which was so startlingly different from ours. And I think it's not about individual words, it's about a cast of mind and the symbols, the images, the metaphors through which your character sees the world. The metaphors employed by their inner voice. 
they need to be consistent with their worldview so that things are cast far more in terms of religion and magic and in many ways the visible world uh, than they would be if you were writing about later eras. Oh, for example, Cromwell has been a cloth merchant and he's been in Italy, so he knows the trade in luxury fabrics. So when he sees someone finely dressed, he thinks, how much did that cost? And he can price everyone up. And he also thinks, no, how many yards in that? What's the likely cost of it? How did they get that colour? What's the dye? What's the fixative? So his voice and his world picture is all congruent. I think that there's a long time you, you, you swim around in the deep pool of your material and and suddenly you find you can swim. It's a kind of magic moment that should come in historical fiction, but there's no way of forcing it. And I think how you get there is by casting your net very wide for research. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of reading things, and it's not just a matter of political documents. It's a question of grasping a whole culture. So you listen to the music of the time, you look at the pictures your characters would have looked at, you have to become sensorily aware of another world, what their clothes felt like when they were wearing them. So they're not costumes anymore. They, they are just one's everyday clothes. The Cromwell that we've seen up to this point in the trilogy, up to the point at the end of book two, is a Cromwell who is absolutely on the make, his fortunes are improving and rising, he's bettering himself all the way through, um, coming from incredibly lowly beginnings to a, a place now of absolutely astronomical power. The final book of the trilogy is going to be about him coming back down again. No, actually it's oh, not. It's not. <laughs> um, no, no, it's, no, it, it's, it's the story of his rise and rise. Uh, he has four more years during which he will ever more firmly put his hand on government business and his fingers into every pie being baked in England. And he will rise eventually to be Earl of Essex. So the shape of the book is his rise and rise and then very sudden fall right. in the summer of 1540. How does it feel writing that? Because from reading the book, it seems to me that this is a man with whom you have an affinity, whom you have a relationship with. Does any part of you want to save him? Uh, well, I've taken the precaution of writing the end, <laughs> uh, or at least in a rough form. Yeah. Uh, the end of the trilogy is implicit in the very first line of World Fall. As that book begins, the 15-year-old Cromwell is lying on the cobbles in his father's inn yard in Putney. His father's kicking hell out of him and the boy is thinking, in a moment, I'm going to die. And a voice is saying in his ear, so now get up, now get up. And this is his beginning, and this obviously will be his end as well. We have a lot of work to do together, Cromwell and I, before we get to this point. The thing is, there's a lot about the third book that I still don't know, both in historical terms, in that there are things that haven't resolved into sense yet for me, and also in terms of how the material will be presented. I imagine it will be different from the first two books, as they are different one from the other. And in a way, the rhythm of Cromwell's life has changed now. In the first two books, we work first of all towards the climax of Thomas More's execution, then to the destruction of Anne Boleyn. But as we move into the third book, every day is a crisis. There is no downtime. And 
in the end, what will happen is that because his opponents are unable to destroy Cromwell one by one, he'll get a pincer movement. And at that point, the forces against him are just simply too strong for anyone to resist. Mm -hmm. But then again, you see, there is the idea, there's the saying that all political careers end in failure. Well, I don't think he would have regarded his career as a failure, mm -hmm. um, except as much as it is in personal terms, if you happen to be minus your head, the end of it. You said at the beginning of this interview that these were the books you were meant to write. What do you write after the books you were meant to write? I have various ideas. Um, before I, I began to write Wolf Hall, I'd actually made a contract with my publisher for two novels, one of which was set in Africa in the early 80s. Now, it may be that novel will still be there for me, but that's a delicate thing because a project can go off the boil. And, of course, when I began the Cromwell novels, I didn't know there'd be three of them. Mm. I didn't know it would turn into ten years' work. So maybe that novel's gone, you know, past its use by date. I don't know. I'll have to try and pick it up and see. I've got lots of ideas. Um, I only feel short of time in the sense that historical novels eat up five years of your writing life at a time. And I would like to write another historical novel, but I can't see myself moving to yet a third period. Mm -hmm. I'm at home in the 18th century. Now I'm at home with the early Tudors. I don't know whether I've got it in me uh, to, to take on a third period. So, you know, I could move a little bit forward. I could move slightly backwards. But the thing is, you have to find the person mm. who engages you. Uh, someone who's going to be your colleague in this endeavour. And I haven't found another person yet. Hilary, thank you so much for talking to us. Really good luck with the third book and congratulations again. Thanks.